So one of the things that I was asked was to talk more about how each one of these starts from a weakness and then how it then becomes a, becomes a strength. So I, I mean, we can go back and do all of them, but let's start today and, and then I mean, uh, we'll see about the, that the ones nice. that we done. <laughs> the ones we did. We tried get the to idea. figure it's it out, right. but we didn't, we didn't get it. Okay, so we ended last time with uh, Chesed, if you remember. And we talked about um, Avraham being the example of Chesed. Okay. And, uh, the, it's the ability to do good things. And we said that this was what it means to have an image of God. That the image of God in, in a person is his ability to act with kindness. So that's what we ended with. I don't want to go back to it. Um, but now we come to Gvura and Might. And in Might, if you have the page from last week, I hope you do. If you don't, I might, I might have a couple more left here. Yeah, I do. Oh, actually, this is you know, this is the five verses. No, I don't think I. I was surprised that I gave them all out because I thought that uh, I printed like ten of them. In any case, I don't think I have them here. Maybe the first you can give to me. Can I see yeah, the bottom? Yeah, yeah. 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 Put That's it in mine, there. So. Oh, okay. So it's okay. Smell. Yeah. So you can look. Yeah. You might want to look. So with, with Gvura, so you have the, the important For task of making sure that I say it correctly. <laughs> with Gvura we have... It's from last week, isn't it? Oh, it's a mixture. So with Gvura we have um, a very interesting uh, take on what being a man is. And this is maybe the one that illustrates the weakness Almost the most. Second, the one, the other one that you would expect to have a lot of weakness in it is um, is uh, is hod, is a acknowledgement, right? Because hod is always the weakest of everything. So in Gvura we have the statement in the Talmud it says uh, Rabbi Yochanan says that Adam, the word Adam is an acronym. It's a very un, not well known acronym. He says it's Adam is dam, sorry, efer dam mara, or dust, blood, and bile. What's the word for bile? Bile is mara. Mara. Mem reishe. There's four of mara. Mem mara? Mem reishe. There's four uh, different bile's. Dust? dust is efer. Efer? Mm -hmm. Like I am dust and ashes. So really, uh, actually, afal uh, ve'efer is really ashes. It's not. It's not dust. Oh. It's, it's, I don't know who made a mistake in the translation. I think it's kind of surprising that they made this mistake. Um, ashes. So ashes, blood, and bile. <laughs> ABV. <laughs> and what's the idea behind this? That this is in the, the this Rabbi Yochanan says this in the middle of a page and a half in the Talmud that speaks about humility and um, the vice of arrogance. It's really where a lot of what we learned in, in uh, Rectifying the Ego was taken from. There's a page on, in Sota, page 5. So it's very easy to see what the weakness here is, right? The fact that we're ashes is not, well, you know, today you don't say you're ashes, you say you're, you're space dust. Right? That's the modern form of saying that, that you're made out of ashes. Space yeah. dust. Space dust. Yeah, all this uh, dust that collected on Earth <laughs> and life was started from. Um, so that's the modern way of saying it. And then the sages had, had their own way of saying it, which is uh, they were made out of ashes. And they took this from Avram, who says, I'm only dust and ashes. And what do you mean by ashes? You mean that dust is the inanimate part of me, and the ashes are what's left over from the growing part of me, the vegetable part, the part that does grow, the part that is alive. So when you, if you would burn it down, all you would be left with is ashes. You wouldn't even have dust there. 
and ashes are, you know, the wind carries them to whatever direction. Um, the blood and the bile are not so clear, but blood, you can understand that blood is the life force in the person. So when you say that, you're, that you have blood in you, so there's two different meanings that you can take from that. One is that I'm weak because um, I'm dependent on my blood. If you take away my blood, then... Right? But you can also look at it a little bit more deeply and say that when you say blood, really what you're talking about is the oxygen. That's the redness in the blood. Like the, um, what do you call it? The hemoglobin in, in the blood. And it's, it's there to carry oxygen. And what you're saying is without air I can't, I can't survive for a minute. It's a very strong weakness. And the bile, especially in, in the, uh, you know, the ancient medicine, uh, bile were, the four biles were the roots of the different uh, cravings that a person had. But the most important one was the green one. Whenever Shakespeare says the, the green-eyed monster, right? what is that? He's not talking about the Incredible Hulk. He's talking about envy. Why do they call it green? He's green with envy. Because the ancient system of medicine said that envy comes from the green bile. I mean, uh, it's what we today would call phlegm. Right? Phlegm is a green bile. But blood is also a type of uh, bile, by the way. Blood was the red bile. So bile is saying that we have character weaknesses. We have weaknesses in, in our cravings, in our envy, in all these negative traits that we have. So it says, if a person remembers that Adam, Adam, a person... Man is ashes, blood, and bile. Then they put themselves in the right frame of mind of how to see themselves. <laughs> I'm not such a big mitzia, I'm not such a big lick, not such a big deal. Because in the end, I'm really very lowly in, in all my uh, abilities and all my temperaments and, and everything like that. So how do, you, how do you turn this around? How does this become your strength? Well, each one of them can be a strength. We know what ashes does. We know the famous story from Rabbi Nachum Ishinamzu, that he went to Rome, and he suddenly has a, uh, a uh, treasure chest full of dust, of ashes. And then he says, somebody says there, maybe this is the dust and ashes that Abraham used when he said, I'm dust and ashes, and with that he won all his wars. And indeed, they find out that humility is a tremendous uh, is a tremendous way to fight a war. Yesterday, I was talking about this with somebody. I was actually for a while. I've been thinking of, of it is, there's a, a man from Los Angeles that I uh, I have a, a regular uh, session with every week, and we tape it so nobody knows his name. We never mention names, and we're learning together just as a chavrusa. We're learning. Uh, um, Submission separation Sweden, uh, transforming darkness into light. Mm -hmm. He's a very, very special man. And I don't know why, in this Chavrusa, stuff comes out of me that I, I'm amazed every single time. So <laughs> we were thinking for a while, and I asked his permission, and I'll do it eventually, of putting those recordings up on the Patreon so that Tell people can listen to it. So oh, yeah, I was thinking about it. Mm -hmm, but I don't know it's a very special uh, learning session. I've never had any, anybody like him before. Um, Great. We so yesterday we were talking about this. Is he and religious? What? Is he? No, he's not. Um, Who? This man from Los Angeles. Um, so one of the things we, we were talking about was that, that um, uh, when, when you see yourself as humble, you actually have more power. <laughs> uh, how is that? How is that possible? So there's many, many explanations. You can't get into all of them. We've, we've seen many of them over the years. But I, I, th I think you know, one of the main things we try to convince people is that being humble is actually a power. And being ashes is not being weak. It's exactly the opposite. It's being, a, being ashes is the way to actually um, um, uh, make sure that things happen. So one of the things that came up yesterday was that the good martial arts, the ones that, ones that are really good, 
they also see themselves in a humble way. And actually what they do is, they don't exert their own force. Rather, they, 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 um, they, deflect. Right, they deflect the force of the other and, and use, it, use that. And so actually when, when you're humble, uh, like Mount Sinai, so the Torah comes down on you. <laughs> it's like there's room. Or the way we've been discussing it many times, that when you're humble, you make yourself into a vessel. And when there's a vessel, it's filled with something automatically. Um, maybe one of the strongest examples of this that I've seen is there's a breathing technique in the East. I won't mention its name. But what they do is, um, when I was studying this, it really, really surprised me to see it happen. But basically what you do is you exhale very strongly. And when you exhale strongly, so you, you, you have a tendency at first to want to inhale strongly. And you quickly hyper hyperventilate. <laughs> it takes like you know, four, five, six breaths and you're out of air. You're out of breath entirely. And the secret to it is that you exhale with a lot of force, but you don't, you don't inhale at all. And then you see this, that almost the statement that nature abhors a vacuum. And the air just fills you up within, without any effort at all, and in a split second. It's, like, it's almost impossible to believe until you actually get it down. And then you can see that you can just breathe by exhaling forcefully. <laughs> you never take you a breath. Even if you don't exhale forcefully, it happens. It's right, the pause. Right, right, right. And it's delicious. It just, it just, it just fills in. you anyway. Yeah, I do that underwater. That's a good way to stay underwater. Breathe out. Don't just hold breathe your breath. Out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but here, but nothing's coming back in when you're when you're not in the water. So it's, your lungs just fill automatically without any effort at all. So there's this thing that we've talked about many times that you know. That if you also, if you if any of you will get wonders this week, you might not. <laughs> um, um, but you can always download it and read it there. So something that we we actually talked about not long ago that the work in bina, that the category of psychological work in bina and understanding is contemplative prayer. And one of the things that was mentioned there is that when, you, when you're praying in a contemplative way, what, what you're doing is you're creating in yourself vessels. And those vessels are filled with God's compassion. It's like automatically it's filled. So ashes, is a, being humble, is a very, very powerful tool. So it's your weakness, because you're right to be humble, <laughs> because that's all we are, is dust and ashes. But that actually is our superpower. And it allows us to do things that we couldn't ever do in any other way. So that's what the ash is, um, the first one. Then we have the blood. So the blood we mentioned is like hemoglobin. But, but the idea here is that the sages describe blood as the indi indicator of balance in the body. That's how they describe it. So that the blood has to be, I guess today they would say, how much of the blood is plasma and how much of it is liquid? How much of it is water? I don't know what they call that. I mean, maybe that's a homiletic index. I'm not sure. Um, and when it's not balanced, when the water and the plasma is not balanced, that's when the illness starts. So the blood represents for them, in, in their world, that's by the way why they let blood. The reason that they let blood was that there was an understanding that there's too much water there and not enough blood, and not enough uh, plasma. That was one of the main, main understandings about, about, uh, about blood. So blood is actually what we call homeostasis. So the fact that we have blood... I'm sorry, what is homeostasis? The, the blood is basically what keeps homeostasis in the body. It keeps the balance between okay. things. So, in, for instance... Uh, if your extremities are cold, and so there's no, the blood flow is not good. It should be better, and there's ways to work on it. But the, the whole idea is that even though we're very dependent on it, it's also our strength that we can, we can reach homeostasis. We can reach a state of being in balance. Okay, so, so that, that's Bura. Bura is, again, it's the bodily functions, and all of them are very weak. The human body is very weak. It's not, 
doesn't have any particular strength, it doesn't have a shell, it doesn't have an armor, it doesn't, it's not robust enough, and so on. But for all its weaknesses, what it has in weakness it makes up for in agility, you could say, in its ability to keep the balance. Like, for instance, if you look at a, like, a human being is not supposed to cook like a frog. Like a frog, if you put it into, because it's amphibious, if you put it into, uh, into a pot and start cooking and boiling it, it probably won't feel it, because there's no homeostasis in it. It doesn't, it doesn't realize uh, what's going on. So, I mean, it'll just boil alive. But a human being, because of homeostasis, we feel that one part of us is becoming too hot, or we're entirely becoming too hot, whatever it is. That we feel, that's why we're not cold-blooded, and we're warm-blooded. Our blood is warm. And again, what it means is that we have an ability to self-regulate. So all the self-regulation would be, would be related to Gvura. So that's innate, right. you're saying. Like it's not like there's any effort. Expenditure you don't need to, to expend any effort happen. physically. But when it comes to the psyche, so you do need to expend effort, but you can do the same thing. That's why we're able to, um, you could say, um, cope with, uh, with a lot of different uh, circumstances. So how do you do this about it in the psyche? Mm -hmm. It starts from recognizing that I'm weak. The recognizing ah, the that I'm weak okay. is what allows the me weakness. to begin to... It, it's sort of like I would say that the frog is so certain of itself that it doesn't have to interact with its environment. That's, that's what it means that it's cold-blooded. And we do interact. When, you have, when you're too big and you have too strong a shell, it's pretty easy to bring you down. <clears throat> but when you're small and you're weak, so you have to be careful. Um, th there's a lot, you know, the, the last book that, uh, what's his name? Uh, that wrote uh, The Tipping Point. Mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm Gladwell. So his, oh, yeah. his last uh, book was, uh, I think, um, he started with uh, King David and, and Goliath. And he tried to argue that it actually wasn't a fair fight. Well, the premise there is, and we said this, we said this that, uh, that the Maccabees are described as weak, and they, they won against the powerful. And, and the weakness, again, is the sign, if we have to say it a little bit more, the weakness is the sign that we have to reach balance. That's, that's the thing that someone who is not weak doesn't feel. They think that everything is fine as it is. Like that's our vulnerability. Right. right. Our vulnerability is, we have many vulnerabilities. The one here is that we, we have a weak body. We have a weak um, character that tends to, um, I spoke to a naturopath on Shabbos, and he said to me that he always limits it to 80% what they need and 20% he doesn't get involved. He lets them do whatever they want. Because they say it's too hard to do 100%. Most people uh, will gain nothing because they'll break after, they won't be able to handle it after. <coughs> so you didn't gain anything. So he says when you, when you take it into account that there's weakness, you can actually balance things properly. And it could be that because of that, uh, that's exactly what it means. That's how the Rambam described it, that every change that you make, you can make, you make very slowly. So it's like taking into account that because you're balancing all the time, then it's a longer process, and you're not pushing it too fast, either. So it, it's like a weakness, but it's also your forte, when you take it into account. Wait, how does the example about the naturopath make that point? Because if you were strong, strong-willed, that you didn't have cravings, then I would just give you 100% exactly what you need and then cut out everything that you're not allowed to eat. Okay. And you would be able to hold that diet. Right. And okay. seemingly you would be healed more quickly. Okay. But the Rambam says that it's not that simple because, because you need to reach balance. You can't just turn cold. There's no cold turkey in, 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 in health. Okay. So if you go 100% exactly what you need, 
you're actually going to do a lot more damage in the but beginning. But how are you seeing that 20%? You so that 20% is like giving in to your weakness. It's like saying, for the person, you, you can't prevent them from eating chocolate. You know, 20% of the diet is going to be whatever they're used to eating anyway. Right, but are we saying that 20% is somehow strength? Yeah. And what is the strength? Of that strength 20%? is when I'm taking into consideration that the person has cravings and weaknesses, then it could be that I'm actually <coughs> making the healing process work better rather than if they were 100% uh -huh. able to just stick to whatever I gave them. It's, okay. what, it's what makes you a human, and if you don't take that into account, then you're, you're blasting the body with something that's actually harder for it to, to get, a, uh, uh, get used to. So it won't get used to, so it'll just stay. Right. So, okay, I got it. Okay, so let's move on to the Tiferet, the beauty. And here we have the, the most important, maybe the most famous usage of the word Adam in a, in a verse. That's when God says, Nase Adam, we'll make man. What does it mean there that who's, who's, who's we? Who's, who's he talking to? Right, so there's a lot of different opinions on who God was talking to when he said, let us make man. So the most surprising one is the Mea Shiloh, uh, Rabbi. And he writes that he was talking to all the animals. Have you ever heard this? That's, yeah, that's the Medrash. Did he bring something new? He says he was talking to all the animals, all the, all the life in the world. And what was he saying? He's saying we all need to contribute to make man. So man is an interinclusion of everything in, in, in reality. All of life is in man. So there's a lot of stuff that comes out of this. Um, by Rabbi Ginsburg, this is a very critical building block for understanding evolution according to Torah. Yeah. We don't mean evolution as a I say it, as a scientific phenomenon, but rather as a thought phenomenon. You can't run away from the fact that evolution is logical. Even if, even if I don't believe that it actually is how life came about, or how life differentiated, speciated into many species, the thought process of evolution is very logical. And that's, that's why it's so, so, uh, it has such a strong grip on people. Because it makes sense. So I don't know if I can prove it in any way scientifically. I, uh, short of having a time machine, there's no way to prove it. But then there's the missing link that there's allows always, for all the doubt. Right, right. There's always, always. There always are. Um, they're not impressed by it anymore. Um, you know, as a thought process, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and, and spiritually, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but the core of understanding it is to understand that mankind is like an evolution, like the way that evolutionary thought would argue, it's a little bit different, but it's the same notion, is the last to appear. That's how the Torah also says it, we're the last to appear. But in the Torah, the idea is that everything contributed to making man. That's why man is responsible for the entire world. That's why I can pray for rain. That's why I can pray for, for the well-being of other life forms. That's why I can pray for everything. And everybody is, well, well, is very familiar with uh, Rav Nachman who says that it's good to go out to the field to pray with all the animals of the field and all the blades of grass and all the trees and everything to pray together with them because when you pray, you elevate their prayers higher. And that's what basically it says when man was created, right? The, the chapter of Tehillim that we read Friday night. That man says to all the animals, let us bow down before God. He says, together, let us bow down together. They all bow down together. But without man to tell them that they, they wouldn't understand that that's what they need to do. So in that sense, man is inclusive <coughs> of all the life in, in, in the universe. But when you say that you're inclusive of something, you also mean that you're in some way dependent. <laughs> it's also a weakness. 
It's not just a, it's, it's not a, just a, a positive thing. It's a weakness. It's also a weakness because I feel affinity. Like the Baal Shem Tov would say that I and the ant are brothers. Why are we brothers? Because we're both creations. There's no, I don't have, at the, at the basic level of being the creation of God, I don't have anything on the ant. Right? I and the ant are just two creations that God made. You have to understand that that's, that's a chna, that's submission. You can't really, um, you can't really take responsibility for something if you at some level don't identify with it. So how do I identify that we're both creations of God? And I, just as much as I take care of myself, I have to take care of everything else. So that's a weakness. You can see that as a very strong weakness. But it's not just a weakness. It's much more than that. But how does it become a power, though? How does it become something, uh, a strength? You know, it's not a fault. But how, does, how does this weakness become a strength? Could you explain first how it's a weakness? I, I, don't, I don't really get it. I'm not independent. I'm not independent. I, I'm dependent on all of nature agreeing to create me. <laughs> the way that people say today is, the day you were born is the day that the God decided that the world couldn't go on without you. That's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what you should be saying is that the day you were born was the day on which nature was incomplete without you. Yeah. That everything in nature comes together to create whatever is being created at this moment. Everything is going into, so you're sort of like a sum total of everything. But that makes you not very strong. That makes you very dependent on everything, deciding that you should be here. <laughs> if you say, you put it that way, then it's not a source of, of, of egocentrism. It becomes a sense of, I think, depend dependence. That you're dependent on everything, deciding that you should be here. That includes other people. Maybe it's other people also. Maybe at some level. It's certainly my parents. In the sense of, like, the shores, like, it right. works. Right. Right. That you, right. You're heavier, which makes you... you know, so how does that become a power? How does that become something of a strength? So the operative word is adaptability. Um, man is more adaptable, able to adapt to his surroundings and every, anything else in, in, the, in the world. We can live anywhere. There's animals that live in the Arctic, but men can live in the Arctic also. There are animals that live at the equator and in deserts, and men can do that too. But there's no animal that can do both, except for men. Meaning our strength is that we take this weakness that we're inter-included from everything, and we can use all of those powers. So that's where you get to say, yeah, Spider-Man and Batman and, 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 and Hawkman and Hawkeye, whatever all these things. Why, why do you get all these animals? Because basically what you're saying, that, and that's how we start even the Shulchan Aruch, right? You should wake up in the morning, and like a bold, like a leopard, was, was bold as a leopard to, to do the will of your creator. All these, all these animal traits are what make us so, so resilient. On one hand, I'm dependent on them. On the other hand, they've given me the power to use their uh, traits. And so that makes me very adaptable to everything. Could you say, like, it kind of opens the consciousness up into the achdut? Because we're all yeah. one, which is really our greatest yeah, it's true. strength. But so, so we're all one, and what does that mean for me? Are we all one in the sense that we're equal? So it says, no. We were created, says the Ishbitzer, as a result of everyone else contributing to us. So we're not that equal. <laughs> we're actually on the bottom of the, of, the, of the creation ladder, if you want. But because everything's been funneled into us and we're dependent on everything, because of that, that's why we're so adaptable. That's why we can really go through anything. We can do anything. We have all the gifts of all of, all of creation. We, have the, we just talked about the gift of dust, <laughs> being dust and ashes. 
And even the dust and ashes went into us. So what does that make me? It makes me humble. I can be humble. An animal may not know how to be humble. It doesn't know if, if it's the uh, alpha dog or the alpha wolf or whatever it is. It, it doesn't know how to humble itself. It will get killed. It won't know how to say, oh, okay, I, I, I defer to you. <laughs> it doesn't know how to do that. No, they do. You see them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's not yeah. they always end up getting really hurt. I just watched Jordan Peterson's video uh -huh. on lobsters. Mm -hmm. Lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> it's only because of you that I know yeah. about this kind of thing. Um, but no, but sometimes animals, you know, they can feel out and they get submissive. Yeah, they decide not to fight. So that's a giant. That, that's that's see, a giant. Like they can protect other animals. They can protect them. You're saying their instinct just makes them go right. and instinct. go for it. That's instinct. But it's not, it's not a it's, it's, it's not, it's not free will. It's not it's even not. understanding that I should, I mean, that's why no animals do martial arts. They don't, like, use the other's weight against them. Mm -hmm. They, they just need to, they, they go full head on, from what I understand. Okay. So there's no, there's no ability to, to but it's not, it's not just that, it's also, um, to be, well, everything we've discussed about humility so much, there's no animal that can right. do anything like that. No. Okay. <laughs> and now we get into Netzach. Netzach's really, really interesting. Maybe the most interesting of us all. <laughs> so the, the Pesach by Netzach is the Pesach that the prophet Samuel says. And it reads... Moreover, the eternal of Israel, eternal is Netzach, does not deceive or change his mind. Here it's change his mind, but really the literal meaning is it doesn't deceive. Oh, oh it's okay. Yeah, deceive is like to lie, so it's fine. Does not deceive or change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. <coughs> Again. The eternal of Israel, this is referring to God as a word, Netzach Yisrael, does not deceive or change his mind. He doesn't lie, and he doesn't go back on his decisions, for he is not human that he should change his mind. So in Netzach here, we have a very interesting, uh, something that we haven't seen in Torah, that the phrase used in the verse with Adam in it, with man in it, is not man. He's not human. So in, in, in Netzach, the power is that you're not human. It's to be not human. So this is a very, you can also hear it. Because Netzach is victory and eternity. And those are two things that are not exactly human qualities. I mean, all, of, of all the sfirot, the one that's really not fitting, <laughs> it doesn't really belong as, as a description of, of man, is Netzach. Because what does man have to do with eternity? There's no connection. Well, there is. What? There is. What? We, because Jewish people, we're going to be eternal in terms of <coughs> Yeah, but right now, in our world, there's no, there's no connection between a human being and eternity. We're the opposite of eternity. We're, we're all passing. Nobody has ever gotten out of life alive, right? Everybody ends up in the same place. Said it. When it changes, it changes. We're talking about right now. But that is also leadership and say the orchestra, and that's what you're saying about we're at the end, we're responsible for everything. Well, that's another meaning. The literal meaning of Netzach is to be victorious. The conductor is someone who's victorious over the orchestra, so then you get this idea of harmony. But it's a more secondary meaning. I think the main meaning is still that it's victory and eternity. And here it's used in that sense that God is called the eternal of Israel. So, he's described as not human. That makes sense. But, how could you describe one of the... Because we have a piece of him. Okay, so what is that piece? Right. 
So because because our nature is not to be eternal. Our nature is on the contrary. Everything is everything is passing. Everything is falling piece. apart. <laughs> that's still that's, that's our weakness. Right. So <laughs> you would say that 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 small part. That's like that. We say we have a one bone. Trying to say that there's some substance in the body that will remain somehow. But the, the, the pshat is that nothing remains. Right? Nothing remains. So. Wait a what about the chelik So that's that's already Metaphysical. something that is that, right. It's, it's beyond. Okay. It's okay. I mean, we, we, we wouldn't say that that's a weakness. <laughs> Adarabha. Yeah. 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 So, so what is this? What, what, is, what does it mean by man to be eternal? So we can't talk about eternity and time, because that won't work for us. So we have to have something else. Um, and the verse sort of gives the hint. Because it says that the eternal of Israel, he won't deceive and he won't change his mind. Because he is not human. So humans do what? They deceive and they change their mind. When you say they change their mind, what do we mean? That they're inconsistent. Right? Why are you inconsistent? Why are we inconsistent? Because we're weak. Well, what do we mean we're weak? We can't carry it through. We make a decision. And it's too hard to follow it. So at some point, we give up on it. So actually, Netzach is stubbornness. The, the power be, that this transforms in, it isn't to be in eternal, because we can't do that. That's not in our power right now. But what is in our power? What is in our power is to be stubborn. Right? Okay. This is a nice flip. Yeah. That's very nice. Again, what is it based on? It's based on the fact that I am changing my mind. <laughs> I'm prone to change my mind. To be stubborn is to go beyond the mind. It's, 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 why do I change my mind? It's not just some, uh, some, some crazy uh, fault that I have. It's a weakness. It's a weakness because I can't know everything. So, so I changed my mind. But to be stubborn is to say that in spite of the fact that I should have changed my mind, I don't. I follow it through to the end. And it's stubbornness, it's steadfastness, it's, it's, it's above reason. That's a bad thing, isn't it? So it can be a bad thing and it's, it can be a very powerful thing. Um, I always, because I, I don't have so many stories to tell, so I, I, I've told you many times about a friend of mine who was started this company and for 20 years I was running around trying to, to, to get clients and it was, it was ahead of its time with robotics and medicine and and he wrote to me he said right. and I should have given up a long time ago we were in massive debt and it wasn't happening and, and, I, and everybody left already was alone peddling his, uh, his wares in, uh, in the United States and suddenly he hit upon it and, and he was stubborn because he's a stubborn character and because he was stubborn, he, he, he made it good. So the same thing is true about the Jewish people. Why is it called the eternal of Israel here? The fact that Hashem is eternal, very nice for him. How does that help me? So it helps us because we take from him that quality of not changing. I mean, I mean, for us, eternity means not changing our minds. <laughs> that we decided that the Torah is it, and that's, and, and that's it. We're stubborn. I'm <laughs> kshelech. Right? It's, it's a positive trait, and can become a positive trait. So everyone in the world tells you, no, this is obsolete, we have a better theory now, we have this, we have that. no, I'm stuck with this. I'm not willing. Even, even facing incredible odds, even facing every single sign that I'm wrong, I don't care. That's my stubbornness. And why is it? Because I realize that I have a weakness to jump from one thing to another, because I don't know everything, so I have this weakness that will drive me to uh, start something and then say, but there's a better, you know, neighbor's grass is more green and, and, and so on, and all these things. So I, so, I, so I build the stubbornness in me, which is the strength that comes out of this fault. It's said to be a good quality for the stock market. Yeah, yeah. It is. What would you say? Wow. It took me, uh, I lost a lot of money until I learned. 
And you need a lot of emotional fortitude. Oh, you, you need to not look. You need to just be stubborn. It doesn't care. I don't care what happened today. I don't care what happened yesterday. I don't care what happened last year. Mm -hmm. I don't care what happened last day. Just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's, very, it's very tough. So one of the ways of doing it is just not looking ever. And the other way is that you just, it, it builds resilience in you. you. It builds your stubbornness. And eventually it pays off. It's an amazing thing. You just see it. And you see it once, you see it twice, you still don't believe it. But the, and, and, and then the next crash, you sell it all, and then, you know, and you lose. <laughs> it, it takes so much time to understand that whatever you, if, if you're really <coughs> going to do something, you have to be stubborn. Um, this type of stubbornness is what gets people out of difficult diseases, what's men's marriages, it's what um, fixes a lot of relationships, and it's what keeps the Jewish people going. It's this, this quality. And again, it, it comes from the weakness. The weakness is very real, that we have a tendency to change our minds a lot. <laughs> and because we change our minds, because there's always new information, there's always new, new circumstances, and, and you want to change them. So that's a weakness, it's true, but you can turn that into something positive when you recognize it. And so you, you say, I have, to, I have to go beyond, beyond this, uh, this weakness. And, right. uh, For the person who's stubborn, they don't see it as a weakness. It's other people that see it as a weakness well, and say it to the, them. The stubbornness is not the weakness. I'm saying that stubbornness is the, is the this remedy. Is the remedy. Yeah. Okay. But it only works if you realize how weak you are. <laughs> all, the, all these weaknesses turn into powers when you recognize the weakness for what it is. Okay. I mean, if you're just stubborn for the sake of being stubborn, that's probably not, not, not going to help you very much. Here we're saying that you're stubborn because you recognize that you can't flip-flop. Because your tendency is to flip-flop. So, so you have to, you keep switching your mind. So you have to combat that in some way. You have to work against that in some way. And then the, the weakness actually becomes uh, a positive trait. Now, victory and acknowledgement always go together because they're the two feet. So, so, so the, it's not so surprising that the pasuk, the verse for acknowledgement, for hod, is very similar in a way, but it's not going to be talking about the resilience or the, the, the eternity of God, but rather on the fault of man, entirely on the fault. Here we're just going to bring it straight out. What's the verse? The verse we're very familiar with. For there is no righteous man on earth who does not sin and do good. Everybody sins. Everybody does things wrong. We all make mistakes. We all err. So this is the, this is the most salient weakness of all. To admit because acknowledge, acknowledgement means to acknowledge, to admit something. Lehodot. To admit that we have weaknesses, that we are prone to fail, right? How does, how does our whole rectifying the ego course start? How do, how do we start always? That you're liable for every negative thing you can do. <laughs> You won't do it. If there's anything that's negative, you'll do it eventually. Why? Because that's how the animal soul is. That's how we are. The moment you understand that, the moment you accept that general weakness that we have in animal soul, and therefore we will make infinite numbers of mistakes through our whole lives. There's no other way it can be. Adam ain't tzaddik That even in doing good, we sin. Even when doing good, it becomes a liability for us. Why does it become a liability? Because we take credit for it. Right? We want acknowledgement for it. We want to be acknowledged that we did a good thing. So the moment, the moment you can acknowledge all the weaknesses, then the hod becomes something else. It becomes something entirely different. What could hod possibly turn into?
Why is it a power? That's that's rectifying the ego. <laughs> that the, the that the reason that people have such a tough time in life is because they can't acknowledge that they're not perfect. Not only they're not perfect, they're prone to doing everything wrong. The moment that you can forgive yourself, not forgive, it's not forgive is the wrong word, but the moment you can acknowledge that that's just how I am, 99% of the stress is gone. Somebody comes to me and says, uh, in one of my jobs, somebody came to me yesterday and said, I wasn't very, after a year that he said the opposite, now he says, the boss says, I was really not happy with how you handled this in this situation. So I'm thinking of giving, uh, running this uh, project to someone else. So my first reaction was, how dare you? <laughs> my second reaction was, maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. Why am I... Am I perfect? I did it exactly the way it should have been done. <laughs> so I thought. So I wrote to him. If you have somebody better, then I'd be happy to work under them. And it's like <laughs> he wow. wasn't, we didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. He hasn't reacted since. But sometimes people take this. I understand the words passive aggressive, as if I'm saying, "Okay, then do it." No, I'm not saying okay. Do it. I'm saying you may be right. But if I would assume that there's no possible way that I made a mistake, and there's no possible way that I mishandled something, then I would get into a very heated fight and lose anyway. Or maybe win, but it would be a very pyrrhic victory. Mm -hmm. And and I would ruin my relationship with someone. And why? They might be right. So the moment that I can, I, my acknowledgement is to acknowledge my weaknesses. I have many weaknesses. Did you say classically like Yehuda? Right. And yeah, it's a coming in. He saved the whole lineage of King David. And he created it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The moment that you have this ability to acknowledge your weaknesses, you have the biggest power in the world. Well, you're being humble. Huh? You're being humble. It's not, it's not just humble, it's much more than humble. Hum the result may be that I'm humble, but I have to acknowledge my weakness. The result of acknowledging my weakness may be that I'm humble or I'm more. So, what is, so, is this study in Yeshi? Kind of like the cross. To deal with that. everything. To, to really deal with life. To really deal with who I am. Really, not just save things, but actually to make them move forward. Also, like on, you stand in the emet. Like that's True, the emet, right? which is. So you, said, you mentioned the word stand. So what's the first thing we say in the morning? What, 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 am, what, am, I, what am I admitting to? That without Hashem's faith in me, I have no, I have no, I have no ability to survive. Okay, so, so the word, um, Rabbi Tzad loved this, this comes from, from the Rebbe's, uh, the one thing the Rebbe ever wrote was this uh, kuntras called the the Indian of Hasidus. <coughs> what is Hasidus about? So there he took, you know, Modani is pretty young. It's only about 400, 500 years old. <laughs> Nobody's, the, the, the patriarchs didn't say Modani. They didn't know about this. Well, they didn't have something similar, but they didn't know about what we say. It's a new thing, relatively speaking. And then he, he analyzes Modani according to all five levels of Torah learning. Shat, Remez, Dras, Sod, and Hasidus. So he has five levels of, of, of analyzing it. And he says in Chassidus, it's a very, very interesting thing, that this acknowledgement that we start the day with comes from the word Eden. Eden means a sill, like a window sill. And the sill is what the entire window sits on. So it's a basis. It's like saying it's a foundation of everything. And we know that Netzach and Hod, they're like the feet. Right? They're, they're the, the feet. So... The whole body is being supported by this. So everything that we are, everything that we manage to be, is supported, is held up by this ability to acknowledge our weaknesses. That's the left foot. And the right foot is to acknowledge that we deceive, that we uh, are not consistent, that we change our minds. What is this all based on, since they're very much related, the two of them? 
Netzach and Hod, victory and acknowledgement here. Again, victory was that I that I that I'm stubborn because I have a tendency to change my mind a lot. Well, there's a nice word for that when somebody changes their mind a lot. What do we say? Ambivalent? No. No. Um, That's a very nice word for it. (laughs) Flexible? Mm. Mm. Versatile? Changeable? No, no, no. I forgot. (laughs) It's a negative. It has a negative connotation, this word. It's not a positive word. I don't know. Anyway, in English doesn't work for everything, <laughs> unfortunately. What is it? Fickle. No, that's no. not. That's a negative <laughs> word. That's a good word, but it's yeah. not, not the one I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. The, when when somebody changes their mind a lot, there's there's a name for that. Unstable. Right. <laughs> unstable. So so the stability comes because I'm unstable. That's exactly the point. That I'm, why am I unstable? So so the main thing that makes me unstable is because I don't have all the information. Too much to process. I, I just don't have all the information. So, so here's why this is so important in, in therapy. I mean, the number one thing we want to get in therapy is that the person admits to themselves that they have weaknesses. You know, people come into couples therapy, and the, and the, the overriding uh, sentiment that most of the times we come in with is, I'm right, the other one. and they're wrong. I mean... For sure, that's it. But, th- but that's how I, I, I have yet to meet someone in therapy who didn't come with that attitude, even when they came individually. That's how people think. That's how you survive in the world. And so, so the very first thing I want to work on them with, in any case, is on their ability. Well, sometimes I meet people that don't come in for that. So it's just, there's other problems in the world also. But, but when there's something that's... <coughs> That's, that's harming their, their well-being, their basic well-being. It almost always is, involves this inability to, to acknowledge their own weaknesses. So that's the first thing I always work with them on. I mean, how do you know that you said the right thing? How do you know that it was taken the right way? How do you, until, until they, be, they begin to, 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 to make cracks in their story, until they begin to see that they're painting themselves in a certain way, and that's their self-image, and they're very afraid of losing it. But the moment that you are not afraid of losing your self-image, then suddenly the world becomes a very, a very uh, dynamic, healthy, good place that you can uh, you can actually heal and <laughs> you can actually do good things. In. But don't, isn't it a positive thing to have a good sense of self-image? Yeah, that's a whole topic, huge topic. Well, usually, when we say self-image, we mean the way that a person sees themselves is right. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, that, uh, that they have a certain picture of themselves and they're afraid that this picture will, will, will be lost if they suddenly realize that they're not exactly the way that they thought they were. So we, we usually call it self-idolatry. <laughs> you make it into a, into a, in, into a, a solid uh, granite picture of yourself that can never never shift and, and, and change. So this this is really Netzach uh, and here are like the the pillars, like the two feet, the pillars of all treatment. It's all about finding of of being able to acknowledge that I don't have all the facts and that I am I'm looking for that word. Um, I'm prone to change my mind. A lot. Vacillate. That's also good. That's <laughs> not it. No. Well, I'll find Vacillate. it. <laughs> anyway, let's get to Yesod. The foundation is. I don't have it here, so. Foundation is. Um, the first time that. We meet man in the, in the first story of creation. So there it says, Nasea Adam, that was the very first time. And then God creates man, and he says that he created a male and female, and he called their name man. So this is the simple idea that, in, in Yisod, that there's no man if you're only a male or a female. Now this is obviously a very big weakness. I mean, right away you, you see the weakness in this. 
because it's much better to be self-contained, to be independent. Um, there's, you know, <laughs> whenever you see these uh, movies or, or books about, especially evolutionists like this, that uh, the female really doesn't need the male, right? You know, sort of flip the flip the whole story on its head. Mm-hmm. And then it's not the, the male that doesn't need the, the female, it's the female that doesn't need the male, because the female can do big word in Latin, which means self self uh, fertilization. Okay? And, and, the, and there's many, many species of animals that do this. Snakes do this, and there's a lot, a lot of things that do this. And so you have this part, it's called parthenogenesis. Some, some words I do remember <laughs> from time to time. Mm-hmm. So, so if, if, if we were like that, that would be much better. Why, why do you need? And we said that, that there's a whole question in evolution. One of the big questions is why, the, why are there sexes? Why are there, why are there a male and a female in the first place? So the answer that the Torah has is because it teaches you that you're not self-contained. It teaches you that you're not independent. That's a weakness. But that weakness is your strength. So that's one of the answers that the, the bio- biologist will give, is because there's sexual reproduction that makes the offspring more viable genetically. They become more robust genetically. That's not necessarily true, but it's a good theory. <laughs> because we've seen um, uh, um, species that are very robust and they don't have sexual reproduction. Like amoebas, for instance, they're pretty robust. They're also simple, so the, the, the argument goes that when you get into a complex situation, then you need to have sexual reproduction, otherwise the genetics, genetics are weak. But in any case, the example of this is when, when Jacob was shepherding Laban's uh, flocks. So how did he t- how did he choose? How did he select? How did he make the flocks create the type of animal that he ag- agreed that, that during that week or that month that he would receive from the flocks? So he separated out <coughs> the animals that didn't want to mate. It says Vayuha atufim levavah. Atufim means the ones who were self-contained, so they could work. They were snug in their own coats. They didn't want to connect. If you don't want to connect, says Yaakov, I don't need you. I need the ones that have this weakness that they need to connect. That they need to have this relationship. That's what I need. And from that, I'm going to choose the most robust animals. Those are the animals that will make up my flocks. And on the face of it, it's the opposite. It's the, the ones that don't need to mate that are the strongest. They don't need anyone. They're independent. They're self-contained. They don't need anything else. But this weakness that we need, that we're made male and female, is our strength. It itself is our strength. Why? So here we get into something that's been all along <coughs> the middle axis. We didn't mention it until now because here it's really pronounced that when you have two opposites, when you have two opposites that are coming together, so how, how can you, how, what do we call that when two opposites are together? We call that a paradox. So for, for there to be marriage, there has to be paradox. And paradox opens you up, marriage opens you up to something higher than yourself, something higher than even your existence as a couple. That's why we say that when it, through the marriage, the divine presence can come down. Why? Because there's two opposites here who are willing <coughs> to put their differences, at least on a lower tone, so that something higher can appear. That, that's the greatness of it. And, and to do that, I have to turn a blind eye and I have to not comment about everything and I have to swallow a lot of uh, swallow my uh, pride a lot and, and this and that and all these things but in the end it's worth it because the strength the resilience that comes out of willing to admit that I need to be with someone else 
that is the infinite itself. Hashem appears now. This is also the same thing in, in Tiferet. We didn't, didn't mention it, but the adaptability that we're talking about. Why are we so adaptable? Because we're willing to be made up of everything. And when we're willing to be made up of everything, we can be everywhere. Like I said, you can live in the Arctic and you can live in the desert. You can be in an easy situation or a difficult situation. You can, you can navigate everything. To be able to navigate everything, that's the power of the infinite. So across the, the whole middle axis here, there's the power of the infinite that appears, but it's most pronounced here in marriage. Okay, so we don't have much time, so I want to finish it today. So we finish. So the kingdom, Malchus, the verse is, is basically what we, what we began with. Okay. And that's this verse, Chaviv Adam Shenivra B'Tzedem, that endeared this man because it was created with, with God's image. So here the word Adam is three things. Aleph, Dalid, Men stand for thought, speech, and action. So you say, how is Aleph? Speech and action I see, because it's Dalid, Men. Dibul is speech, that's the Dalid of Adam. And Mem is the Maiset. So we need another man for the machshava. If we would have to have uh, right, the other garment of the souls, thought, speech, and action, we need a, another man. We have your only an aleph. So it's a little bit of a chaf. Aleph is aleph, 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 and man. Yeah, what's aleph? We didn't say it. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so you have to do a little bit of a stretch, but the stretch makes a lot of sense. It's not, it's not such a big stretch. So the aleph here is the, the word aleph itself. What does it mean? So it has usually three different meanings. But the, the, the meaning that most people know is because of the shape of the ancient aleph is that it means an ox, an aluf. An aluf is an ox. So in the ancient Hebrew script, it looked like a, a, a circle with two horns. Hmm. Oh, you had two legs and two horns. Kind of like a, <laughs> so the horns went up. Then slowly it deteriorated and it became just a circle with one horn. Hmm. But that was the ancient uh, Hebrew script. <coughs> and the, the, the way you, they usually explain it is that this was a symbol for an ox. Again, it was pictographic in the beginning. That's, at least, uh, th that's the natural development of the Hebrew language. It's not the language that we received at Sinai. At Sinai, we received the whole prophetic language, which came complete with, uh, with the uh, dictionary <laughs> and with the, uh, with the new writing, the new writing, the writing that we use. Right, the script, the, not the script, but the square letters that we use, that's, that came down in Sinai. That was the prophecy. That was part of the prophecy. When, Why did it change to be something that was ancient, that was different? Was, well, there was a language before that prophecy. There was a natural language people were speaking. You know, the, the Jews that, came, that went down to Egypt, came out of Egypt, they were speaking something. It's like Yiddish. Uh -huh. <laughs> speaking something. So that had its own way of being written and how, and how, was, how the language was understood. The prophetic experience at Sinai, what it normalized, was a whole new character set. We have new letters and new meanings for all these uh, words, because the, the, the prophecies begin to reorganize the language and its meaning. Oh, yeah, there's no question that, that you know, uh, Yosef, when he went down to Egypt, he wrote in ancient Hebrew script. He didn't write it until he didn't have it. Maybe somehow in his, in his prophetic mind he saw these letters. Wow. But what it means that all the people saw the sounds means that they saw these letters. They, they saw these new letters coming down. The, the Talmud says, this was actually just in the Dafyomi a couple of weeks ago, or last week, um, Talmud says that it, it wasn't used, these letters were not used, um, except for in the Sefer Torah, until they came back from Babylon. So until they came back from Babylon, all this, everything you would find it, and, and much later also, like in regular texts, you would find that they were using the ancient Hebrew script. There were a lot of reasons for it. Before the Torah script, they were using In the, the Torahs, they, they were it. using... But they, when they were writing... But the writing Torahs. normally, it's like us, it's the same oh, thing by us. So they were using the regular script for day-to-day for -day transactions, uh -huh. or whatever, or whatever, and that's what you find. 
which, which, by the way, means something very interesting about the, the texts that are still found, that we've never found a text or earlier than, I think, the 2nd century BCE, that is in, in, the, in the block letters, in what we call uh, our Aramaic script, not Aramaic. Oh, maybe they thought it was, it was too called. holy to write right, in that? it was too holy. Hmm. And even by us, one of the reasons why we use the script today is because the, the block letters are considered to be too holy. Hmm. In any case, um, Rav Kook has a very interesting take on it. He says that the reason that um, they took these letters out of the Torah and they started using them um, for other things was because these letters, because they are blocked, meaning they're squares, they're straight letters. So they have more resilience when it comes to being in exile. Interesting theory. That the script gets jumbled. Mm -hmm. But the square mm -hmm. letters are harder to, to, to mix up. And so, um, in any case, so get, getting back to this, so 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 Aleph also means le Alif. Le Alif means to to teach someone. So Aleph Chachochma, that's the verse in uh, in, uh, in Joel. It means I will teach you wisdom. To teach. So Aleph stands for thought. It stands for the, the for the wisdom. For, it's always always wisdom. Aleph. So here we have thought, speech, and action in. In, um, in in the kingdom, so what what is our what is our weakness in the kingdom? It's not too hard to to guess. Is that we're naked. That's that's our weakness. What does it mean that we're naked? We have no thoughts, no speech, no action, until someone gives them to us. What is a person if he doesn't? If you don't have these garments of the soul, you feel naked. So a person who has who has nothing to think about, nothing to, no one to speak to, nothing to do, just immediately feels naked, and we feel like we're, we're not in the world. Right? The big principle of Kabbalah is that any light that doesn't have a vessel to go into, it doesn't have a covering, can't express itself, and therefore it it it, it, it goes back to its source. It can't stay here. So if a person doesn't have thought, speech, or action, he doesn't have these garments, then they, they find no interest in life. And that's basically what happens to, when you get older. Right? I think I've talked about this in the past. There's nobody you could speak to because nobody understands what you went through. You can't speak about the 70s or 80s. <laughs> For me, that's like... My but I guess there's people who can't speak about the 50s and 60s. Well, does get lonely, are you? Yeah, you're lonely. There's no one to speak to. There's nobody understands what you're talking about. Especially your kids. <laughs> and and you don't have the, the, the strength. You don't have the koyak to begin to explain. You don't understand. We didn't just. We weren't just created two minutes ago. The world, you know, it went through a process to get here. And the young people just assume, well, this is how the world is. So it's just an example that when you don't have anyone to talk to, you feel naked. You feel you, you feel like no one sees you. You become transparent. So the 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 big principle of Torah is first of all that do something. That's why halacha is in malchus always. Mm -hmm. the, because halacha is always <coughs> you always have meaning. You always you're never transparent for Hashem. Why? Because even if you're a slave in Egypt. Here's a mitzvah to do. I need you for this. So the weakness is that we are naturally transparent. We're naturally naked. But that itself is our power. So we're born without any garments? You, you, most yeah. children. No, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> yeah, but that's the, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's physical but, and but it's spiritual. what about your garments? So what? You don't have any garments? For no, nothing. Nothing. You so have to build it. <laughs> you have to begin to find how to express yourself. So that's the strength. We're weak with this so the strength is we can build on right. nothing. Right. That's the strength. Right. So the, the strength is that we have an affinity to garments. It's a powerful thing to need garments. It's not a negative. It's, it's a weakness, but it becomes a power. Because if you have the garments that are yours, if you made something into your garment, like we say, 
that every mitzvah can become your shining light, right? The Mai Have Avuch Zayil Tfei, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. If, if a mitzvah becomes something that you're very connected to, it's what gives you strength in life. You become stubborn in <laughs> this, I want to... Uh, I mean, just a comment. Sometimes I love, I love like, you know, best books about special people. They have unlimited strength, just like you said. These people that do the mitzvah, they can. Yeah, they, they, they can never, never stop. Sleep. Yeah. They never stop. You can go from strength to strength. If, if you don't have something practical, you know, <laughs> I once tried to count this, but I, I got tired. How many words do I say every day? actually utter how many words do I actually utter every day it's somewhere I, I before nine o'clock I utter something like 10 to 15,000 words I think it's even more than that just davening and learning something before for half an hour I've already said 15,000 words I have a place in the world <laughs> that's how it is now imagine somebody wakes up in the middle of I don't know Wyoming Nobody around for miles. I mean, maybe, maybe he writes a few things <coughs> on, you know, today on, 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 his, on his smartphone. Even if I'm with no one, I'm in, I'm in a Turkish prison, I still daven. <laughs> I still say things. I still have purpose because of that. So my garment, not, not to mention my thoughts. Um, I went to the dentist yesterday. And I, I was wondering again, what happens when somebody needs to have... Um, has you know very difficult dental treatment, and you need to get complete anesthesia. Like the, the, the. there were great tzaddikim who were unwilling to receive anesthesia. Why? Because I, I won't be able to think. How That's right. how would I willingly give up these? I don't know this hour or two hours. And not be not think during that time. When, that is me. When you're yeah. asleep, you don't realize you're thinking. Of course not. That's that's why they don't they didn't want to do it because they can't control their thought. Even <laughs> when you're sleeping. No, they, they went to sleep because there was no choice. But they also the way they slept was like, you know, we talked about this. They slept for like <laughs> ten minutes and wake up, and they slept for another ten minutes and wake up. Because why would I waste time in the world not being yeah. with with a garment? I can't do anything, I can't say anything, and I can't think. So even when I'm at the dentist, I was, I was sitting there, I can't do anything, I can't move. And you certainly can't speak, even though they ask you all kinds of questions. You know, move around, <laughs> yeah. I never got that part yeah, from right. the dentist. Um, <laughs> the, the, be the best question is, are you in pain? <laughs> no, I'm doing this because... <laughs> okay. but, um, but you can think. You can think. So I thought. So I close my eyes, and I go over a shear, and I go over this, I go over this, I'm gonna, I, you know what, I don't have a shear in my mind. I go over what I need to say to this person, and what I need to say to that person, and I think. I, 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 I'm in the world. But the moment you take my garments away, I'm nothing. <laughs> I'm not saying that there's no existence without garments, but I'm saying that the, the weakness is also the strength. Because we come without garments and we leave with our garments, so the strength is to adapt them as much as you can while you're alive. And that becomes, the, and so in therapy, that's a really big deal because I started out with this guy in Wyoming who's in the middle of nowhere. And not, you don't know how many people, I mean, all these quarantines, what did they cause? They caused people to become ill uh, mentally because they lost a lot. People lose their garments. They can't do what they did, and they can't speak to the people that they spoke to. They're only left with a small part of who they were. And so that, that, that destroys you. Loneliness, right? So, I, is it more hoot humility? Isn't it, I can see where humility was not involved. Loneliness. Not loneliness. Yeah. Malthus is loneliness. Right. Humility is, is understanding. Humility is being Yeah. Another, another. <clears throat> Understanding is different. Yeah. It's a little bit different. Yeah. But loneliness, you know, what do we say about loneliness? That I, when I look at myself, I'm naked. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the inner equality. I have nothing to my merit. So I'm naked. I, I accept it. 
So then we have the famous story about King David that he, when he was in the in the uh, what do you call it the uh, the bathhouse. So he felt naked from everything. He, he can't think Torah. Uh, well, we we today say we can, but normally a person wouldn't think Torah, and he can't speak anything. He can't say do any mitzvahs. Any we actually don't speak in, in the bathroom. I don't know if you're makbid on this or not, but. A lot of people are not been mm-hmm. never to speak in the bathroom. Never be on the phone. That's a big one. <coughs> well, we can start from that. Who thinks, to be who the thinks about that? You know, don't take the phone. And we back. certainly can't do an actual mitzvah. There's no actual mitzvah that we can do. So he was naked from everything. So he's like in this existential state of, of angst because who am I? What am I? And then he remembers that in his, in his body there's a mitzvah, the circumcision. Mm-hmm. So he needs something physical to have some some grasp of, of life. That's a man. What about a woman? Her husband. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's that's this uh, whole um, picture of our weaknesses that turn into our superpowers. If if we go a little bit more dramatically. <laughs> Okay, so uh, God willing, next week we'll start the uh, fourth class, the fourth lecture. Which is? I don't know, I haven't looked at it yet. Oh. <laughs> um, we're all going to be pleasantly surprised, I hope. You want to tell us the weaknesses of the first couple of students? Okay, yeah, I'll try. Thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Start. We'd have to start like now. <laughs> <laughs>